This is the Farm Monitor. For over 50 years, your source for agribusiness news and features from around the Southeast and across the country. Focusing on one of the nation's top industries, agriculture. The Farm Monitor is produced by one of the largest general farm organizations, the Georgia Farm Bureau. Now here are your hosts, Ray D'Alessio and Kenny Bergamy. Uh, my heart is full. Hmm. Thank you so much for choosing us for your next half hour of Farmtastic Entertainment. I am Ray and the man to my left, making Georgia's very own Kenny Bergamy. Well, thank you. Yes, born and raised. We have a lot of ground to cover in this show, so let's get started. Coming up, get ready for a wild ride in Georgia's forage world. After a stellar start last year, producers faced a drought-fueled nightmare. Now the spring has arrived, a forage expert reveals if hopes for a rebound will materialize. From a humble food blog to a global agricultural powerhouse, how Feast Global is connecting farmers to markets worldwide. Plus, discover the heartwarming tale, or rather, tales, of Farm Dog USA, where rescued pups become heroes for farmers in need, including Georgia's own Skippy, American Farm Bureau's Farm Dog of the Year. Just some of the stories you will see, and it all starts right now. At 4 million acres, the Georgia forage industry is vital for feeding livestock and generating top-notch hay. But as John Holcomb reports, it's been a rough go of things for producers, including last year, when so much promise quickly took a turn for the worse. Spring has officially sprung here in Georgia, which means hay fields and pastures across the state will be starting to flourish, signaling a new production year for forage producers. According to Lisa Baxter, State Forage Extension Specialist, producers are hoping for great conditions like they saw early on last year, as the weather was nothing but ideal and producers got some relief from input costs. Overall, given the limitations we've had over the last few years, 2023 was a great forage year for the most part statewide. We had pockets with some challenges in it, but with some fertilizer prices starting to come down, people getting better control on weeds. It, it was an incredible hay year for a lot of producers. We had some very well-timed rain overall. Um, there were definitely pockets that we, we were a little dry, but that worked well for hay production because we were able to get some timely harvest in and not have to rush to get something bailed before the next rainstorm. However, Baxter says that great year all changed last fall as a large portion of the state suffered from drought conditions, especially the northwest corner which ended up hindering fall planting due to just how dry the soil was. We had an incredible summer last year, a not so great fall and winter. And so coming into fall, a lot of the state was fairly dry at the exact time that we needed to be planting winter grazing. And so for the most part, producers were fairly late planting winter grazing if they could get the drill in the ground at all. Um, a lot of seed just stayed in the bag last year, unfortunately, because when we're not looking at rain in the forecast with the lack of irrigation in Georgia for forage production, it just wasn't worth putting that seed out. And so as good of a summer as it was, fall and winter was hard, especially for the northern part of the state. According to Baxter, due to those drought conditions, especially where it was severe, it's going to be a waiting game. As she says, they won't really know how things will shape up until warmer temperatures are here to stay. To give you a reference, we turned in drought loss estimates, some less severe than others, for 120 counties in the state of Georgia last year, so essentially the entire state. But there was that pocket up in the northwest corner of the state, um, 13, 14 counties, that did hit disaster level of drought. And I think we're still trying to determine how severe that drought was because going into fall, that was peak tall fescue growing season. And so for producers not to have that stockpile available for tall fescue and not being able to plant that winter grazing, it really set us up for some big challenges in that northwest corner of the state. We expect that fescue to come back this spring, but time will tell. We don't know for sure. While rainfall has occurred, it's been highly variable. And so it's one of those wait and see games, which is what no producer wants to hear but there's no way to know until we get through this spring and our temperatures start to warm up. Reporting in Tifton for the Farm Monitor, I'm John Holcomb. 
Uh, meanwhile, in a reassuring statement, the Georgia Department of Agriculture is emphasizing the safety of dairy products statewide following reports of bird flu affecting dairy cows in Texas, New Mexico, and Kansas. Reportedly, the virus primarily impacts older cows, causing decreased lactation and appetite. However, the Department of Ag assures consumers that the issue is localized to the region, yet they urge producers to maintain strict biosecurity measures. The USDA, meantime, confirms the safety of commercial milk with milk from affected animals having been diverted or destroyed. And it is worth noting that pasteurization effectively eliminates viruses ensuring safe consumption of milk in interstate commerce. With agriculture being such big business here in Georgia, connecting farmers to the right consumer is essential to building a successful market. That's the mission of Feast Global, who recently held an event at Tucker High School spotlighting one of the state's signature crops, the peanut. Damon Jones has more from DeKalb County. As is the case for most things in life, big things come from humble beginnings. And that's certainly the case for Feast Global, a multinational company that started off as just a website. Despite that growth, the goal of promoting the agricultural industry and connecting farmers to different markets has remained the same. Our company was really founded as a food blog in 2008. And from there, we were in Mississippi, and then we did things in the south. And then last year, we changed our name to Feast Global. We opened an office in Mexico and the Philippines and India, and we represent um, farmers, ag places all across the world helping tell the story. And that's what we do. We help connect people to great ingredients, and they can be across a variety of different products and product types, but we, you know, it's a relationship business. One of the main products here in Georgia is, of course, the peanut. And with all the time spent planting, growing, and harvesting the crop, there are very few opportunities for producers to get out and promote the industry. The farmers that are out in farming peanuts don't have time to go tell people about the crop they're, they're growing. And so we worked with the peanut industry to help tell their story and, you know, help, help them sell peanuts. There's lots of different things that people don't understand about peanuts and other ingredients and so our job is to educate people on different ways to use it, what, how it's grown, how it's, you know people are thinking about sustainability and you know what you're doing to the earth as you grow any given crop. While this company might work on a global scale there are still numerous local events like this one held out at Tucker High School where students got a first-hand demonstration on how peanuts are used in restaurants from a celebrity chef. We um, have a group of culinary students and we brought in Chef Gennard Wells to combine with me to teach these kids more about one of the things that's grown right in their backyard that they may not realize comes straight from a farm, um, like literally a couple of steps away. Even though most of these students will never step foot in a professional kitchen, having an appreciation for all the hard work that goes into producing the food they eat will help continue moving the agricultural industry forward in the future. I think that the thing that I want to hammer, and we do this internationally as well, you're only as good as the ingredients you start with. And so knowing where your food comes from, and the history and the stories behind it, makes you a better chef and using better ingredients makes your food better. This is going to be a whole generation of cooks and eaters and some of them are never going to cook in a restaurant, some of them are going to cook for their family every night and so when you introduce great ingredients, tell the story, create memories, that's important for them, it's important for the farmers that you're you're helping and so that's what we're, that's what we're here to do. Reporting from DeKalb County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. After the break, Farm Dog USA, where rescued strays find purpose and farmers find hope. When you have an injury like I have, if you sit in the chair or sit on the couch, that's where you go end up. Get by. Because we have Skippy to help us, every day we're doing something. If it wasn't for her helping us with the cows to keep me busy, things might not be as good as they are now. There. Good girl. 
Skippy is a Border Collie, Catahoula Hound, Australian Shepherd mix that we were fortunate enough to receive. We've had her a little over a year now. She's all of the above. She's a partner, she's a pet. She's right here with us, helping us with the cattle every day. Donald was out with his son feeding hay and the last bale bounced the wrong way and hit him in the back of the head, broke his neck, and it bent the spinal cord. He was completely paralyzed from the neck down. I wasn't gonna leave the barn. There wasn't no doubt. As long as I got a breath in me, I'm gonna take care of the cattle in the barn. I was still at Shepherd's Spinal Hospital in Atlanta, and we were introduced to Farm Dog, which supplies dogs to disabled farmers to help them keep going, and thank God we did. Skippy kind of filled that role that, you know, it would take three or four people to herd 40 cows out of one pasture to another. Skippy and I can do it by ourselves. Skippy can do it by herself, to be honest. It's gonna be hard to replace her. She's just such a loyal companion. She's about like my wife is, <laughs> about like my children is. You know, you just think so much of these dogs. This type of injury, you've got to stay busy all the time. And that's why the cattle and Skippy Happiness is responsible a lot for my recovery. Being able to keep the cows and, and something for me to live for every day, I mean, she's contributed that immensely. Getting a farm dog involved with us changed our life. Good old Skippy, a four-legged marvel whose story transcends the boundaries of the traditional farm dog narrative. But truth be told, Skippy didn't accomplish fame on her own. No, nope, her journey traces back to Farm Dog USA, a remarkable nonprofit founded in 2005 by Jackie Allenbrand. Jackie and her husband Chris reside and operate a farm in northwest Missouri. And her mission? Very simple. To bridge that gap between farming and accessibility for individuals who may have thought their days of working the fields were over. Farm Dog USA is deeply rooted in compassion and practicality. The inspiration struck at a farm show where Jackie Allenbrand encountered a farmer coping with a partial leg amputation. Witnessing the challenges he faced, Jackie envisioned the immense difference a trained farm dog could make in the lives of farmers in similar circumstances. You know, these dogs, they're, they're not dogs that you raise from puppies. A lot of them, the majority of them are strays, am I correct? We take some from the rescues and some from shelters and we also take some donated dogs as well. You know, our motto is save a dog, help a farmer make a difference. You're giving a dog a purpose and the farmer a purpose to keep going. Every dog trained by Farm Dog USA carries a special purpose. But Skippy, as Jackie finally recounts, possessed that extra spark that set her apart. We have a trainer in Iowa uh, by the name of Don McKay that did most of the training with Skippy. Um, I've gone up there <clears throat> a time or two and um, Don and I stay in communications about the dogs. And he was saying, I think we've got a good one here. He said, this is a, this is a dog, excuse me, that he had uh, gotten from the neighbor. And he said, I see something in her. I think she'll be a good fit somewhere. And so I said, okay, let's continue working with her, you do, do her uh, your skill training with her on the, the cattle with cattle, and let's see what she turns into. And she's turned into quite the dog. <laughs> <laughs> turned into a good one that we're so happy and proud of. So uh, it's a big big honor for us uh, to be recognized in that way. And and uh, and I admire Donald and Laura Adams the way they've continued to work with her because that's an important factor. You have to continue to work with them. Oh, she's a friend. She's, I mean, she got a Skippy. And number one, I didn't understand what farm dogs did. I thought they just herded cows. Oh, it, like I said, there's so much more. 
the one thing that people don't know about Jackie is we talk about the herd dogs and Skippy won the 2024 Farm Dog of the Year. But she also uses Labradors to do retrieving, to open gates, to do other services if you're not a cattle person or sheep or goat and don't need a herd animal, you're a row cropper and you are a mechanic and you need people, you know, a cow to go, I mean, a dog to go open a gate or brace for you to stand up or go fetch you a hammer. Laura Adams was a guest speaker at this year's National Agribility Conference in Atlanta. While at the podium, she shared the story of how Skippy enabled her husband Donald to continue farming after a devastating spinal cord injury. Laura's testimony, underscoring the vital role farm dogs play in the accessible farming spectrum, and the conference itself, a melting pot of ideas with participants from around the globe converging to share insights in the latest innovations. It's hard to get the, the, the message out, um, but you know, avenues like this are very helpful. Um, we try to work through our extension service as much as we can. Um, and there's you know, just some uh, stigma to, to being a, considered a disabled you know, or a person with a disability. So uh, what we try to show is you know, um, we're, not, we're just trying to get you back to farming to the level that you're, you're happy with and uh, keep doing what you're happy doing. Our, our theme is it's always about hope. And, and we've used that term for 30 some years that agribility is about hope. Is that we've worked with farmers who, who oftentimes are judged by outsiders as they should stay home, go on social security benefits, whatever it is, when in fact uh, a farmer never wants to quit. As accessible farming continues to evolve, the need for organizations like Farm Dog USA becomes increasingly apparent. Jackie Allenbrand's unwavering commitment to expanding Farm Dog's reach shines brightly. However, she acknowledges that realizing this vision hinges on crucial financial support. We don't have corporate sponsorship. We don't have a steady dog food supplier. We don't have those folks that, uh, you know, provide the, the vet meds and those sorts of things because we're a small organization made up of farmers ourselves. Mm -hmm. And our goal is to have a training center so that we can um, house more dogs. If we can house more dogs, that means we can help more farmers. Well, I can tell you some of the calls she got after the farm dog video went out, uh, there was an, an FFA organization that wanted to do a fundraiser. Any FFA, uh, 4-H group that wanted to do a fundraiser and help her, a corporate sponsor would be great. Uh, Perina obviously was interested in her when they you know, did the Farm Dog of the Year. I hope and I'm hoping that someone will step up and be her corporate sponsor. So as you can see, through Skippy and the nonstop efforts of individuals like Jackie Allenbrand, hope blossoms for farmers across America, proving that with a loyal companion by their side, no challenge is insurmountable. Up next, from city life to farming dreams, meet the couple who turn their inspiration into a thriving agricultural venture. The average family spends $1,500 each year on food that ends up uneaten. Food is also the single largest category of material placed in municipal landfills, where it emits methane, a powerful greenhouse gas that contributes to climate change. You can help reduce the environmental impacts of uneaten foods by composting. Compost is decomposed organic material, made from materials such as food scraps and yard waste. Compost recycles nutrients back into the soil and can help your garden grow by improving soil health, reducing greenhouse gas, and protecting much more. How do you compost? There are many options. You can collect food scraps in a covered bowl or bin in your kitchen and put them in your backyard composting bin or pile. You could even start a worm compost bin. They use less space and the worms do all the work. You can drop off your food scraps to a municipal or community compost center. 
you can pay for a private compost pickup service. What can you compost? There are many food and paper products that can be composted. If you're composting at home, start with fruit and vegetable scraps. If you're planning to drop off food scraps, check with your municipal or community compost organizations. They may be able to accept other products as well. For more information, visit www.usda.gov forward slash food loss and waste. Finally this week, Blackbird Farm in Marion County. Founded at the height of the pandemic, it was a leap of faith for one couple looking to improve the struggling food supply chain in rural areas. But as Damon Jones tells us, they now run an operation that can do just that year round. With a number of businesses being shut down and the supply chain being disrupted, nearly everyone's way of life has been altered by the pandemic. And that's certainly the case for the owners of Blackbird Farm as they traded in the hustle and bustle of city life for a long time dream. At the beginning of the pandemic, we were living in Metro Atlanta and had been exploring opportunities and ways to possibly get some land of our own move out. We knew that we wanted to be growers. We knew that we wanted to be invested in agriculture in the state of Georgia. We didn't know what that looked like. So we were exploring a couple different opportunities. As for what they settled on, that inspiration came from a duck pond they managed in the back of their suburban home. So I started using plants to help filter the water. And I, I was like realizing these plants were doing great growing in the water. So I, I was looking on the internet about things, reading stuff, aquaponics popped up. I thought, wow, that's really cool. I started doing some research and I came to charity and I said, I got an idea. And it may be crazy, but you know, it's something unusual. It's something different. And from there, they jumped in feet first, putting not only their money, but also spare time into making it a success. For the most part, it was me, but down here by myself for three, four months, putting a lot of bolts and screws and drilling holes and concrete and everything else. The first thing I always tell people is I built this myself. I mean, because it, it, you know, it, it was so much work. And having done that and feeling like it was going to kill me at the time, having it done and being able to actually grow things and see these beautiful plants we can, we can produce has been very rewarding. That feeling extends to their efforts in the community where they hope to provide a fresh and nutritious option to this underserved population. Having a local source of produce, that allows us to give food back to our community through sales or donations or whatever that you know looks like. And so it creates a local outlet for things that people don't have around here. Thanks to the closed system and controlled environment hydroponic growing offers, this produce is literally available any time of year. We grow 365, so that's one of the benefits of the greenhouse is that we can grow all year long. And when we're thinking about produce being in season, agriculture being in season, our season is 365. While that is an advantage, it is also a huge responsibility as there is no off season. However, it's a way of life they wouldn't have any other way. There's a lot that we have to take care of. There's a lot that we have to manage and being involved in every step of the way with that is so exciting because I'm learning so many different things about plants, but even just so many different ways about how we get that harvest to people. Interacting with the community, I think is my favorite part. Reporting from Marion County, I'm Damon Jones for the Farm Monitor. Damon, thanks a bunch. Before we run out of time, just a quick heads up. If you want to stay in the loop with all the freshest ag news, delicious recipes, and updates straight from Georgia Farms, make sure to follow us on our social media platforms and visit us at farm-monitor.com. That way you'll always be in the know about what's happening in the world of agriculture and with us here on the show. Until we meet again, stay safe and enjoy a fantastic week ahead. Thank you.